Good morning. I am Rogan and I am back for part two of testing and signing off on a patch. And today we're going to actually do it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to step through a little bit more information and some of the steps in abstract and then we're going to actually do it. And I will try to keep the abstract part pretty short and sweet. So again, you can find me on IRC as our Hamby. I'm on the mailing list. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And the new dev uh, development group has their email list on both the wiki and on the Evergreen site under communication. Sign up for that if you're new. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is launch pad tickets with pull requests. That is on this tab right here. I didn't. I talked about Launchpad a little bit last time, but I did not talk about this tag, pull request. And that is what is pulled up right here. A pull request is important because a pull request means that there's actually a patch available for testing. Now, you can skip these ones that say fix committed because obviously there's nothing to do. The others you can click on, pull up the description, and it should have the pull request tag right here. And you can scroll down and find where the patch information is. And I do recommend that you read the discussion. Now, some are going to have a lot of discussion. And some may end up not having useful information in the discussion. It may just be back and forth about things that get resolved by the time the patch is listed and isn't important for testing the patch. But some people will be kind enough to put testing plans in, which is really useful. And sometimes there will be discussions about things that are relevant. Now, some are hard to test, I admit. You know, if, some, if you have something like an authentication method and you don't have an uh, open auth server or something like that, you'll have to skip those. But a lot of are testable. And we are going to show in practice what you do with Launchpad in just a bit. Okay, now if you're getting to the point where you're ready to test, you have a server, you're going to need to download and clone the Evergreen source if you don't already have it available. If you downloaded from Git in the first place, you're already set, otherwise you'll need to do this. You're going to want to set up Git. So go into the Evergreen directory where you cloned it, add remote, git remote add working, and then this address. This information is on the wiki as well. Git remote set URL, push working the address. And then you're going to git fetch all. And what these three things do, respectively, is they say, hey, in addition to the evergreen code itself, there is a repo that we're going to call working that we need to work with. There is the need to push to it. And we want, when we push working, to go here. And let's go ahead and fetch all of the patches that are available on there. So they're here locally. If you don't do this git fetch all, then when you go to look for a patch to be available to put into a branch, it's not going to be there. Oh, and I should say git fetch all is something you should redo periodically. And in fact, it's a good habit to just do every time you log in. And then you're going to want to set up git. This is going to make your life a lot easier. You really need to set the config user email and username and then these white space tweaks they are not necessary per se but especially if you get into the point of doing some development as well as testing patches they'll make your life easier and it's just good to have the habit from the beginning so in the process what are you going to do you're going to test the previous patch I put on the slide, this can be the most time-consuming part. That's definitely true. Sometimes it's something simple like, hey, the columns on this screen aren't sortable or they sort in a wonky way. That's probably easy to test. But some can be much more subtle, like strange behavior with holds, where you're going to have to set up holds under specific conditions, set up accounts under specific conditions test, just be prepared for testing to be a significant part of the process. Then on Launchpad, you're going to basically go through some steps. Can you replicate it? Yes, then assign yourself the ticket. If you can't, try to give feedback. Try to give meaningful feedback. Say, hey, I went to test this patch. Here's what I did. Here's what worked for me and what didn't. That's important 
Because if you can't even replicate the problem, then you can't test the patch. When you actually go to test the patch, you're going to want to create a branch. You're going to pull that patch in. This is going to be through git, checkout, dash b, and then the name of a branch. And we're going to talk about some useful conventions there. And then git, cherry pick, dash s, and the hash. Now, I can't go over every variation of what you might have to do in testing a patch. This is a fairly simple one. And I'm saying patch for a reason. We're going to do one commit. If you do testing of more complicated things, like whole branches where you have multiple commits and say a collab branch, it's going to be a slightly different process. You might then want to do something like a git log and end up pulling a whole list. This is a recent um, collab branch for curbside checkout. And then you might need to grab, and that's going to be a command like this, git log working collab gm charlt, that's Galen Charlton who started the collab branch, and branch name, and I'm selling it pretty one line, so that I can just get a listing, and these are going to be my hashes. And I can do a git cherry pick where I pull in all these hashes so I get all the commits for that branch. For time purposes, we're not going to do that here. We are just going to do a single patch. So once you have that in your system, you're going to test it, right? And then you're going to commit a sign off. And it's going to be something like git commit dash am. What this means is a means all. Be a little careful about using am. Make sure you know what you're actually committing so you don't put in junk and unintended files. A message like, hey, it works. I'm happy. And then dash dash sign off. Because you previously set up your email here and your username, when you do that sign off, it's going to add the correct information for your sign off. Otherwise, you need to put that in your message. Then you're going to head back to Git. Grab the link, and then you update Launchpad. Simple, right? It actually is. If you're thinking to yourself at this point, this seems too simple. It actually is a pretty simple process. Now again, I'm not going to be able to go over every possibility uh, and permutation of testing patches, but the permutations I'm not covering aren't more complicated than what I am for the most part. Okay, so this next part is unscripted, and there's always a danger in that, but bear with me and let's test a patch. So I picked one previously. This is Add Workstation to In-House Use Statistics. This was reported way back in 2013 by Ben Shum. Ben Shum is still in the community. And Chris Sharp, just this year, in fact, last month, got around to writing a patch for it. Uh, in that time, this doesn't, it doesn't, let's just say, it doesn't seem like this is a heavy in-demand feature, but either Chris Sharp had some time, time or more likely, because I know he's busy, some situation popped up uh, among his libraries where they were like, hey, we could use this too. So he came in, found the wish list bug, and decided to write a patch for it. So the first thing I'm going to do is assign it to myself. Assign me. And now it says assign to Rogan Hamby. And for this one, there's no previous testing to do, which is kind of a boon for our time. It's a new feature. When there's a new feature, there's not previous stuff to test. So I'm going to open up in a new tab, the link to Git. And if you're in a collab branch with a whole bunch of commits, this doesn't work. But here, because it's a single one, I can just click the link and it will bring me to the files in the patch. Now you're going to have multiple files in this patch, but some patches will just be a single file. But the process and steps aren't all that different. But I picked this one so that you can see several different things we have to do. Now, one really useful thing to do here is to click on the diff, and you can see the changes made by these files against master. Now keep in mind this is a recent patch. It is probably going to apply cleanly. If it is a very old patch, you may have more difficulty and have to do some manual adjustments. 
Sometimes those adjustments may mean that you have to actually know how the code is working. And for example, for this one, you may have to understand how the field mapper works. Field mapper conflicts are going to be pretty uncommon. But here we have PM, Perl module files. And a conflict in a Perl module means that to resolve it, you probably are going to have to know how that Perl works. And it is not uncommon for when there are Perl module conflicts to have one of two scenarios happen. Somebody either comes back to Launchpad and puts in Launchpad, hey, um, this doesn't apply cleanly, it needs to be rebased. Or if the person feels comfortable with it, they might go ahead and rebase it and post a new patch themselves for that, acknowledging the previous work done. So, and then we have some SQL files. This is a convention you can not worry about, this upgrade file. Uh, this is going to be useful to you, but don't worry about the fact that it's just XXX there. Uh, that if this gets picked to master, a number will be assigned there uh, by the core maintainers. For our purposes, we can ignore it. Um, what's important to us is this is what's going to be applied to the database. And all of these are files we're going to look at in just a minute. Okay, but what we really need here is this commit hash. And so I'm copying that right now. I'm going to go to my virtual machine, which is running. And it occurs to me, I have not yet opened this in a browser, which I should do. So let's go to a browser. And I'm go ahead and sign in. I've, I'm going to go to branch two. Register my workstation, use it now, and sign in. And if we go to record in-house use, this is our standard place where we see the barcode and all that. Now, I'm going to open up here. I need a barcode handy, so I'm going to search for Ready Player One. It's probably going to be record 248 that I pick. And I just want some barcodes handy to copy. So let's go ahead and quote unquote test this feature. We're going to submit an in-house use. Then let's go over to the database. We're in Postgres here. psql d evergreen. The, your database may not be named evergreen depending on who set it up and what they named it. This is just sort of the stock default. And if we go look at the tables in the action schema, we can see in-house use right here, action.inhouse use, very simply named. Um, action.inhouse use. And we see the use time. And it's today, 7.13 at 7.21 a.m. That is the one we just did. Okay, and obviously there is not a workstation. So, let's look at applying this patch. We're in the OpenSurf directory. I am logged in as the OpenSurf user. We're going to go to Evergreen. I'm going to do a get status first. This is just a good habit to be in. I'm on branch master. At this point in time that I'm recording this, there's a lot of discussion in the open source community about changing default branches from master to main, but that discussion has not happened within the Evergreen community yet, so it's still called master. So we have a node tar file, a package lock JSON file that are not being tracked. That is correct, they shouldn't be. We're going to ignore those. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get fetch all. Fetching origin, master, releases. Fetching is working, whole bunch of objects. Compressing. This can take quite a little while depending on how much has been done since the last time you did a git fetch all. And I think this might be a new clean install I've done that doesn't have 
well, I haven't done it yet. So this is a good representation of the first time doing it. Which makes me wonder, have I set up my working on this yet? If this is a clean machine, I may not have. We will find out in a moment. We're resolving deltas. And it should at the end give us a really long list. There we go. Woo! Okay. And you can see these user Z banks um, scroll up. They're in basically alphabetical order. So there we go. So what are we going to do? Well, I don't remember now if it's the last thing I copied. So I'm going to come back here and make sure I copy that commit hash again. But I'm going to check out a new branch. Get checkout dash B LP. And this is where I wish I had different uh, copy paste things. This is, I'm going to copy the launch pad number. You don't have to do this, but I think it's kind to use the launch pad number in the naming of things because then it becomes very easy for people looking at patches and sign offs to track what is going to what. So for example, if something somehow got confused and the launch pad number here was different from the one it's applied to as a sign off, a maintainer can say, okay, something's not right here. We need to not proceed with using this sign off. So LP and house use. Again, I could just leave it with the patch number, but a slight descriptor is nice to have. So I've now switched to new branch. I'm gonna do a status again, just cause I'm paranoid. And now I'm gonna get cherry pick dash s and I'm going to go back copy that hash yet again because it's easy to forget the order to do things in when you're talking and describing it to people and there we go that's exactly what we want to see we want to see six files change 20 insertions and if we want to see the same thing we could on the website when we looked at the diffs we can do git diff master and we can see those same changes which is really handy okay so now, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to be updating files. So let's do a git status. Um, we're on the branch in-house use, blah, blah, blah. Untracked files present. And so what we're going to have to do at this point is that we have to update stuff. So let us start with, hold on, I'm going to do a quick pause here uh, and be back in just a moment. Okay, I'm back. Uh, I have reduced the size of the text a little bit. I want it to be readable on the screen, but I have to admit, I usually use my text is way smaller than this, so it's kind of throwing me off. When I, you do a git diff master, it will list the files that are changed. And this is really handy for updating your files. It's going to tell you the path to the file that's changed and what the differences are. So when it's really huge and it's hard to read that, that's problematic for me. And because there's a bunch of the files here, it may in fact even be useful to go over here and get the listings of the ones that you need to update. And this is a path from the root of your Git directory. So if you are in Git at the root like I am, it's going to be the same path to your locally changed file. So let's start with the field mapper IDL. Now if you are new to doing this kind of stuff, one thing you may want to do is use find. and fm idl.xml and do this so that you can find where you need to do it. You might be surprised, for example, with the field mapper to find out that there are two different locations for field mapper to be copied. This is because one is used for one purpose and one for reports. But this means that over here we can take that cp the local version of the file, and then copy it to where the other files are. 
And updating the field mapper is that simple. The field mapper in this particular case is so that other parts of Evergreen that need to read database relations know about the new fields that have been added for in-house use in the database. So next up on our list is ah Perl modules. Yeah. So we're going to start with circ.pm. And these can vary on your system a little bit depending on your version of Perl. So user local share Perl, the version 5.26.1 open ILS is going to be where I usually expect to see them. And this lib one is what we really need. So I'm going to grab the path from here. This will work just fine. I usually would do this from the command line, but the text is so large here, it's difficult to see. I'm going to grab that. And this whole process is obviously going to take a few minutes because there's a number of files. But that also gives us the opportunity for me to show you some things. Did I not? I, I did not. Oh, I copied the wrong one. Notice this showed up three times uh, because we have copies in OpenSurf Evergreen. These are the source files, the ones I'm working with right now. I copied the wrong line. As I said, folks, this was unscripted and live, so and it's also I've been up really early because I want, went to watch a webinar from somebody in England at an ungodly hour this morning. Um, I don't have permission to do this. Why do I not have permission? I don't have permission because I'm not root. That's why. So, because I'm in the OpenSurf account. So let's just go over here and do it from here. That'll work just fine, right? Um, but it's not happy with this because I am not in the root directory. So we're going to go to home, open surf, evergreen, do it that way. No big deal. Things are easy to work around, right? So CDBIPIM. So we're going to want to find that. So copy that to somewhere. And Let's see, because experimentation is fun, right? If that is in a relatively same directory. So application storage cdbi.pm. Now, maybe we just copied and created a new file. So let's test it. We're going to find name. Let's have it tell us. Now, the only ones we have are the one there and the ones from our source tree. So it had to be on the system, so we did, in fact. My point of doing that is to show that these relative directories in the source are also relevant in where they are on the system. Okay. Now we're going to have basically the same thing, except in cdbi is going to be a path and it's going to be action.pm and if you want the security of it we can go ahead and search for that first and notice there is another action.pm that's under publisher but it is there under storage cdbi as well as we expected so you can speed things up a little bit by going in here and just editing your previous command. Instead of copying, pasting all around from scratch. Double checking what I did. That looks good. Okay, what's next? Okay, so those are the Perl module changes. Next up is the SQL. That's gonna be a little bit different, applying those. 
So, whoops, I still want to grab the path. So the upgrade file is really handy for this. Now the difference between the schema file and the upgrade file is the schema file is going to be for new evergreen installs. That's going to be used when everything's being built from scratch. The one in the upgrade directory is going to be for existing evergreen installs and the changes they need. If you have already have a test server, you're going to want the upgrade file to apply these changes. If you have a um, if you're building a whole new install with this patch and you want to test it for the schema, you can do that. You probably don't need to worry about that. That's going to be the duty of the people testing the builds uh, when it becomes time to do releases. So here we have an alter table in house use. We're basically adding two columns, which makes sense. And that's what the database functions we're doing is recording that when an in-house use is made. So I'm going to come over here to the seat. I'm going to start a transaction. I'm just going to copy and paste those in here. Seems fine. I'm going to commit it. And there we go. We have everything in. So now we need to do stuff. So what are we going to do? Well, one thing we're going to do is we're going to go to open ILS. And we made changes to the field mapper. When you make changes to org units or field mappers, you should run autogen. And so we're going to do that as the OpenSurf user. Also, we have made changes to Perl modules, which run as services. So I'm going to go to OSRF control, localhost. Again, this is a simple VM. If you're in a multi-brick test environment or something like this, this could be different. But I'm running a single machine virtual, uh, uh, well, doesn't really matter that's virtual. We're running a single machine on the local host. So all I have to do is OSRF control local host restart all. There aren't any changes to the reporter here. If you had a patch that involved the reporter, you might want to kill and restart the reporter daemon. Um, we don't have anything here that is really going to need restarting web surfaces, services, but just to show it, here I'm going to do clear. Um, that's simple from root. There's several ways to do this. I tend to go do this, which is kind of an old fashioned way to restart Apache. Uh, you might also have to restart WebSockets for some, which is, ah. System, CTL, again, this, there's multiple ways to do this. This is just the one I happen to know. OS, RF, um, hmm, am I doing this right? I think it's WebSocket D, OS, RF. That is not right. So I'm going to go to my cheat sheet. I normally can do this from memory, but it's early. This is a little quick cheat sheet for it. Here we go. System CTL restart web socket D dash OSRF. Yeah. It's early. And as I said, this was unscripted. So there we go. We've restarted stuff. So let us go to the client. We are back here. Let's grab barcode again. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste that in there. We're going to record another in-house use. So now let's go back to here and select star from action.inhouse use. And now we see the new one we just recorded, we see the use time, and we see a workstation column, and that workstation 2 has been recorded. Um, workstation being my machine here, so perfect. This patch works, yay. It's great when everything works, isn't it? So I'm going to go back here, go back to my evergreen directory, and now it becomes time to actually submit it. So git commit. Um, oh, first I'm going to do a git status just to get easy and convenient my branch name here. 
So git commit dash am works great for me. Dash dash sign off. Nothing added to commit, but untracked files present. That's fine. Of course, there's nothing to commit. We didn't add anything. We're just doing a sign off. So now I'm going to git push working. I'm going to give it my local branch name. And I'm going to push it to user, whatever your name is, when you set up your git credentials. Talked about that in the last video. And then I'm going to give it the name that it's going to have on the Git server, which I'm just going to use the same one that I did locally. I mean, why not? And in this case, I haven't gone through all this on this machine yet. I'm going to permanently add it. I'm going to give my key sign off. And I'm pushing and done. So now we're going to go to the Evergreen Git server. Um, if you don't know what it is, I find that doing on Google git evergreen ILS brings it up pretty easily, but it's git.evergreen-ils.org. And I'm going down here to the working repo, working evergreen. And right here under heads, I can see the commit I pushed. And we can see now it has this signed off by Rogan Hamby. Great, perfect. That is exactly what we wanted. So I am going to go here, copy this. I could retype it, but I'm lazy. I'm going to go back to Launchpad, to the bug listing. And I'm going to say, worked great for me. Thanks, Chris. Sign off, push to there. I'm going to post that comment. It's going to save, hopefully. And here I'm going to add the tag signed off. See, it even gives me a chance to do an autocomplete for it. I'm going to save. And now that I'm no longer working on it, I'm going to remove myself from being an assignee. OK, so there we go. That's it. At that point, you've done all that, and it's just time to have a party. Hopefully without a Mad Hatter, though. So thank you for joining me. This is about half an hour long. And I hope this is helpful for you in learning how to test and sign off on patches. Have a good day. Bye.